Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much to the organizing committee for, uh, for having myself here. It's been a very long trip, and I'm happy to be here. And I know I am the thing between you and lunch right now. So we're going to try to get a quick workout in, and we're going to try to be efficient as we do it as well, too. So if we can pull up my slides, that'd be great. All right, so fantastic. So we're going to talk about athletic hip injuries in the soccer athlete and the role of hip arthroscopy. So all the talks that we've gone through today are talks that are helping to save kids' lives. This talk is not about that. We're saving hips, but we're not saving lives. So here are my disclosures, none of which are relevant to the content of this talk. So in addition to everything that I do at Columbia, I am also one of the team physicians for the New York City Football Club, which is one of the major league soccer teams, as well as the New York Yankees. And we play both of our, both of our teams play at Yankee Stadium, and, um, and you can see on this picture here. So as we all know, soccer is a beautiful game. And when someone gets hurt, whether real or fake, it's an unfortunate event. So when someone comes into the office with hip pain, it's important to be on red alert. But I'm going to stop right there. Right now, you guys are hungry. You are ready to have lunch. Blood sugars are low. And I don't want to overwhelm you with a list of 45 different things that you need to keep, a, uh, keep an eye on. So I'm going to help plant some seeds of confidence so when an athlete or a kid comes in with hip pain, that you can be able to appropriately evaluate and then refer when necessary. So as I said, there's 45 different things that you need to keep an eye on when you, someone comes in with hip pain. But I try to make it a little bit simpler. So when someone comes in with hip pain, more times than not, this pain is coming from the hip joint or the muscles surrounding the hip. But other things to keep in mind are the core in the low back, the bowel, the bladder, the reproductive organs, as well as the knee. So the hip is incredibly important because it helps to distribute stress between the axial and the appendicular spine. And when an athlete is doing sporting activities, it helps uh, they experience six to eight times their body weight. So this area takes on a lot of load. It's subjected to a lot of high stress and is very susceptible to injury. And the reason why we worry about this is because these injuries can cause for a lot of loss of playing time, can be pretty ambiguous as well too. So it's not uncommon for me to see uh, a young kid in the office with hip pain and they'll have a few different things that are going on because these symptoms have been going on for so long. So this is complicated and we're gonna try to simplify things here. I think of the hip similar to Times Square. Lots of bright lights, lots of people, lots of things moving into and out of the area. So we're going to try to simplify this for you. So when people come into the office with hip pain, we're, uh, particularly above the genitalia, we're usually thinking that there might be an intra issue, I'm sorry, an intra-abdominal issue, or sometimes they might have a core muscle injury or an issue at their pubic symphysis. Their pain along their belt line, we're thinking of more of a rectus muscle injury. Pain along their medial groin could be an adductor muscle strain pain about the anterior aspect of their hip, either thinking of a hip flexor muscle injury or an intraarticular hip injury. Pain that's coming from the side could be hip bursitis, or wrapping pain is the lumbar spine. So as again, as I said, lots of things to keep an eye on. And this is an article that we wrote about uh, the physical examination of the athlete's hip that came out a couple years ago. And we'll make sure to get to the organizing committee so that we can share it with you guys. So this is going to be our overview. And we're going to help to provide some foundational information here. But then we're going to go through some cases at the end to help uh, solidify some of these points. So all these different muscle or all these different soft tissue injuries around the hip that we're going to talk about, there's a lot of overlap between them, and I'm going to point out some of the keys between uh, some of the key differentials between them. So an adductor muscle strain. This is actually a very common muscle injury that we typically see uh, in the young athlete. Uh, tend to see it in a lot of sports where there's quick side to side motion and at risk for a potential muscle injury. And what this is, is is an eccentric load at the adductor muscle. It's a big muscle with a very, very small tendon attaching to the pubic symphysis, which puts it at risk for injury. When the athlete comes in, they'll usually complain of a, an acute event where this pain is coming about. And on the physical exam, they'll typically be tender to palpation right over their muscle. They'll have pain with passive stretch, and they'll have pain with resisted adduction. This is typically something that can be diagnosed through the clinical examination. And in higher level athletes, we might consider getting an MRI to make sure that there's no other concomitant pathology that we're worried about. In terms of the treatment, we usually try to protect the joint. We try not to do too much with it too early because if you end up stretching it out, stretching that muscle out too early, you can actually cause an exacerbation of their symptoms. The physical exam is going to be focused on building up the muscles uh, between their adductors and adductors, working on rebalancing the, the core muscle strength and strengthening the, the low back. We'll also consider doing cortisone or, or PRP injections, and I'll go into that momentarily. So in terms of getting these young kids and getting these athletes back to sport, it's once their pain goes away, they have full range of motion and they have full strength that we can get them back. However, with adductor muscle strains, there is a high risk of a recurrent injury. So it's a fine balance that we need to work, uh, work on with this particular population to get them back, but not so fast that they put themselves at risk for injury. 
And then those athletes who are actually at risk for this are those who have weakness of their adductor muscles, uh, have an imbalance between their adductors and their adductors, so their muscles on the side, or they have decreased hip range of motion. And these are all things that when we see uh, young athletes for their pre-participation physicals, uh, we assess this and then we're able to put them on strengthening programs and uh, preventative programs. This is, in, in, uh, this is actually a study that not with, uh, not with um, soccer, but with American football, where they looked at these injuries in high-level athletes, and they actually found that those who were treated non-operatively were able to return to play at a much faster rate. So very rarely is an adductor muscle uh, tendon tear or muscle strain something that we need to talk about surgical intervention. Now let's talk about osteitis pepis. This is a non-infectious inflammation of the pubic symphysial joint, and this is typically where we see hypermobility of the pubic muscle because of a lot of rotatory motion. So you can see in the soccer athlete where they're kicking the ball a lot, it can cause this degeneration of the cartilage, which then can cause this breakdown or stress reaction across the perisymphysial bone. On the exam, they're going to be tender to palpation right above the genitalia. And uh, in terms of physical exam maneuvers, we can also kind of cause some shearing by uh, producing what is called a spring test, where we put our hands on either side of the pubic symphysis, and we can bounce up and down and reproduce those symptoms. Typically, uh, plain radiographs you'll see right here um, on that upper left-hand part, um, upper right-hand part of your screen. Uh, going to be there's going to be widening, there's going to be degeneration of that pubic symphysial joint, and that is very common. I, we'll, we'll see actually findings as young as 13 years old with uh, with these type of radiographic findings, and we'll all come back to that momentarily when we talk about uh, hip impingement. In terms of the treatment, very similar to what we were talking about before, working on resting the joint, working on rehabilitation, strengthening the core, uh, working on uh, getting the adductors uh, to balance out with their rectus abdominis, and again, considering the use of uh, injections. Now, PRP is uh, some uh, cutting edge stuff in terms of treating some of these athletic hip injuries where we take the patient's blood, we put it into a machine, and we're able to centrifuge out the growth factors and then we're able to inject it to that area to help to stimulate a healing response. So we're able to take their own body, uh, their own growth factors from their body to help reproduce a, a growing effect, I'm sorry, a healing effect. Again, in terms of the treatment, uh, there are other operative options that we have available, but uh, very uh, uncommonly used. Now let's talk about athletic pubalgia. This is becoming more and more popular uh, as it's becoming uh, more prevalent in the mass media. And this is also referred to as a sports hernia or a core muscle injury. And what this is, is this is a muscle imbalance between strong adductors and a weak rectus muscle. So again, the, uh, the pelvic bone is the, is the fulcrum point, and this, almost, and this causes this shearing, point, uh, shearing force across the hemi pelvis. It almost becomes a teeter-totter effect where the adductors pull on that pubic symphysial area and can reproduce that pain. So in terms of the physical exam, we typically see this in the male athlete population, but I will tell you that more and more females are presenting with this. They'll say that they have pain that's present with activity that goes away when they're inactive. They'll have um, pain, I'm sorry, they'll have tenderness on their pubic uh, tubercle or their conjoint tendon. They'll have pain with resisted sit-up, as well as pain with resisted adduction. So again, everything uh, where the core is being activated will reproduce their symptoms. So in terms of the treatment, again, focusing on our non-operative treatment of resting the joint, uh, physical exam, working on core strengthening. However, I will tell you, though, that in the, the, the patient who is appropriately diagnosed with athletic pubalgia or sports hernia will typically need to have surgery, uh, surgery for this intervention. And there's three main buckets in terms of how to manage this. There's the, the minimal repair, uh, there's a laparoscopic repair, as well as doing a broad pelvic repair. And that's a little bit beyond the, the scope of this talk, but just kind of, um, just generally, uh, this is, uh, in terms of the minimal repair, uh, this is a tension-free repair uh, where we end up going ahead and we close the fascia. And we'll also ablate uh, the genital femoral nerve. There's the laparoscopic repair, uh, which is your classic hernia repair. And then the broad pelvic repairs where we take the, the tendon of the rectus muscle and reattach it onto the pubic bone. Athletes who have this do very well afterwards. They're able to return to play within a short period of time after about a two-month duration. Now let's talk about femoral acetabular impingement. This is the most important part of this talk here because this is where everything stems from. So femoral acetabular impingement is essentially a big fancy word for being extra bone around the hip joint that's not supposed to be there. So when we have bone that's present on the femoral side, that's what's called cam impingement. We tend to see that in our young male athletes, those who are in their adolescent to early college years playing uh, cutting sports such as soccer or American football. And then there's pincer impingement in which there's extra bone that's coming off of the acetabulum. And we tend to see that in a little bit of, uh, we see that in the female population, uh, particularly a little bit older. Uh, the older population, and in, in New York City, I, I call it the yoga pants crowd. It's usually the patients who are doing a lot of yoga where they have to bring their legs out and do a lot of abductions where they end up getting into trouble. And the reason why we care about this is because 
hip impingement can lead to labral tears, which can then potentially predispose this, this young athlete to arthritis when they get older. So again, as I said earlier, we might not be saving lives, but by a lot of what we're doing, we're hopefully saving their hips. So in terms of this video here, this is the hip, uh, this is the cam lesion here. You see this extra bump that's coming off of uh, the femoral neck and it's coming in over here on your right hand side. You can see it's causing separation of the cartilage away from the acetabulum and causing displacement of the labrum. And that's that pain that, is, uh, that the patient is presenting with. The pincer impingement again is where the bone is coming off the acetabulum and the labrum gets pinched between the femur and the, and the socket there. Again, one more time. The, bone, uh, the femur's coming up, the hip's being flexed up, and the, the labrum gets pinched in between. The labrum has nerve fibers, so that pinching or that labral tearing can be incredibly painful. So the way that I think about it is the smoke and the fire. So the smoke that alerts, to, alerts us that there is a problem is the labral tear, and the fire that is present is the, is the extra bone that's present. So that's the pincer, pincer impingement on your left-hand side and the cam impingement on your right side. So these individuals will complain about pain about the anterior aspect of their hip. They'll, complain, they'll say that they have pain that's in a C-shaped distribution where they're able to take their hand, make a letter C, and put it around their waist. And they'll complain of pain with sporting activities, whoops, uh, sorry about that, pain with sporting activities as well as pain with just normal daily activities. So sitting at a desk and trying to study for long periods of time, putting on their socks and shoes, going from sitting to standing, uh, going up and down stairs. And in terms of the physical exam, they have limitations of range of motion. So they have a limitation of their hip flexion. They have a limitation of internal rotation. And they'll have pain when we bring the leg across their body into an impingement position. So this is what this looks like here. So we're bringing the hip up. We're now bringing it to 90 degrees and internally rotating. And then we bring the leg across the body where we're trying to take that femoral head and trying to force abutment against the acetabulum to try to pinch that labrum and reproduce that pain. And then this is just some other testing that will apply to it as well, too. So in terms of uh, our evaluation, we always start with plain radiographs. X-rays tell me far more about what's going on with this particular athlete uh, than an MRI. But I will tell you that kids, uh, our patients will typically come in with MRIs more times, and then we'll say that there's a label tear. And we'll go into that momentarily, and we'll sometimes get CT scans uh, for preoperative planning purposes. So this is looking at a plain radiograph of the x-ray here. This is looking at the affected right hip. And what we look for is we look for signs of uh, hip dysplasia. So looking to see if there's any change in Shen's line. We're looking to see if there's any signs of what's called a crossover sign, which might imply that there's pincer impingement. We're looking at the amount of joint space that the patient has. And then we're looking to see if there's any signs of hip dysplasia from uh, looking at a lateral center edge angle. So again, a lot of the things that we worry about in our young pediatric patients, um, uh, when we're trying to assess for hip dysplasia. We still look at a lot of these things, that, but we're looking at it on plain radiographs. But I'll give you a word of caution about these x-rays. This is prevalent all the time. So in high-level athletes, they'll tend to have radiographic findings that are consistent with hip impingement. Whoops. Uh, if we can go back here. So males will typically present with signs of hip impingement. Females will typically present with signs of hip dysplasia. And let's talk about the prevalence of abnormal findings of MRI. So this is something that I, I typically have to dismiss, or I have to talk, or it's a topic of conversation, rather, uh, when patients come into the office. So this was a study that was done a few years ago where they took healthy patients with no hip pain, put them into an MRI scanner ranging from 15 to 66 years of age, and what they found was that 70% of those patients had a labral tear. So it's not uncommon for me to see a patient come into the office come in with an MRI with a report that says that there's a label tear, and then they're convinced that they need to have surgery. Meanwhile, on their physical exam, their pain's not coming from the hip. So we typically have to try to uh, figure out where their pain generator is coming from and talk them off the ledge that they don't need surgery. So this is our treatment algorithm at Columbia. So we have a hip preservation team uh, where I am part of the arthroscopic management of it. Um, and we have our open hip colleagues as well too, uh, ranging from our pediatric surgeons who help us with our littlest of athletes and our uh, hip preservation specialists who help us with some of the more complex dysplastic uh, patients in the older population. But this is what our, and this is, uh, this is our algorithm that we, uh, that we printed out in the Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And again, we'll make sure to provide that to the organizing committee. But we typically start with non-operative management, just as we talked about with some of these soft tissue muscle injuries before. And then we'll utilize the use of interarticular injections for either diagnostic as well as for therapeutic purposes. And this was a study looking at the utilization of non-operative care um, in this population. And what they found, is they broke this up into three phases. So first phase being just patient education, activity modification, and anti-inflammatories. Almost a quarter of those patients were able to get better. Okay. Um, 
Phase two was the use of an intraarticular injection. So almost 50% of those patients were able to get better with non-surgery alone. And then phase three, three was the surgical, uh, surgical intervention. So the patient needs surgery, and which one do they need? So um, for the sake of time, I'm just going to uh, bypass some of this because apparently we have five minutes left. But we went ahead and did best practice guidelines. We gathered uh, hip surgeons from across the United States, and we came up with a, um, a best practice guidelines for who needs to have arthroscopic hip surgery here. And I'll show you what, so what we did is we came up with a safety checklist for everything that needs to be done outside, of surgical, uh, outside the surgical arena. So let's go through a couple of cases here. So this is a 16-year-old major league soccer player, so a professional soccer player in the United States. He was, um, they were at a uh, under-17 World Cup qualifying, and it's this athlete who just kicked the ball, not the one scoring. This kid who just kicked the ball right there. Uh, on that shot right there, uh, he had an acute onset of right hip pain. Previously had felt stiffness, but had never had any discomfort of his hip. He had decreased, rain, uh, decreased range of motion, particularly with internal rotation of his affected sign, and had a uh, provocative maneuver suggestive of a labral tear. Now, looking at his x-rays here, he has a pretty prominent cam lesion that's present for a 16-year-old kid. This is a hip that is at risk. So this is, your hip's supposed to be a round peg fitting into a round hole. His is a square peg fitting into a round hole, which is causing degradation of his labrum, putting him at risk for arthritis down the line. This is looking at his MRI. You can see that he has the presence of a labral tear that's there. And the situation gets a little more complicated. So I saw this kid in May. The under-17 World Cup is in two weeks. It's in Brazil, so four and a half months from the time that I saw him. And then a German club wanted to sign him uh, so he would be transferred from the New York City Football Club to a German club. So in terms of our treatment plan, this. Uh, we went ahead and got a CT scan. You can see here he's got this big bump of bone that's coming off of his femur. And given our seasonal timing issues to have him ready for the World Cup, as well as the fact that this German uh, professional team wanted to sign him, uh, we elected to go ahead with surgery. So this is just looking at his preoperative physical exam. Could you play these videos for me, please? The right one first. So this is looking at his non-affected side and hit the other one on the left-hand side. So he's got 15 to 20 degrees of internal rotation. Can you please hit the one on the left? And then looking at his other side here, this is his affected side. He's got about five degrees of internal rotation. So there's a significant amount of uh, decreased internal rotation on his uh, affected side there. Now in terms of this surgery, this isn't as simple as just going in and making a few small little keyholes. This is, a, this is, for lack of a better word, a torture device that we have to put patients in. We put their feet into these boots. That pillow right there, that white pillow, goes in their groin so we can create traction so we can get into the hip joint. And then we got to pull. So we got to create about a centimeter space so that we can get into the hip joint so that we can do our work. And this is what it looks like. So in this professional soccer player, when we got into his hip, it was completely filled with blood. This is not typical for us to see. So this is, for a kid who was only feeling stiffness previously, he was, uh, he's had significant findings of a, a large effusion that was present. And then when we got in there, this is the cartilage right there. So we have a little flexible device that I'm utilizing. The labrum's on the top right there. And you can see that there's separation of the cartilage away from the labrum, which, is, uh, which will predispose them to some potential early arthritis down the line. So what we do is we go ahead and expose, and we, uh, could you hit the, the lower right hand uh, video as well too, please? We, we're exposing this pincer lesion that's present. So he has this big bump of bone right next to his labrum. So anytime he's trying to do any type of hip flexion, that is banging into his, uh, banging into his labrum and causing his pain. So we come in uh, with a burr, we shave this down, we go ahead and break, uh, bring this bone away. And then we go ahead and we fix the labrum. So we're, again, we're doing this all through arthroscopic means. I'm doing some fancy knot tying here, and we're able to reestablish the labrum back onto the labrum there, or back onto the acetabulum. And then we, once we're done on the, on the socket, we then turn our focus onto the femur there. So right there, you can see all that smooth white. That's fibrocartilage. That's non-articulating articular cartilage. And so we remove that, and you can see now, one, now that we have the bone exposed, 
that is a large cam lesion that's present there. So again, this is for a young kid, this is a rather large bump of bone that's going to be causing future injury to him. So we come in with our burr, we shave it all down, so we make that square peg into a round peg, and we're able to uh, provide congruity back to the hip joint. So I got a couple more minutes here. This is an, uh, one more interesting case. A 17-year-old high school soccer player with six months of left groin pain was having pain above their genitalia about the pubic symphysis and also having intraarticular hip pain. So we went ahead and did some different diagnostic injections, which did give some substantial pain relief. Again, decreased range of motion, uh, pain that's consistent with a, a sport, uh, sports hernia. We can see that bump coming off of the femur right there. You can see that there's an effusion present in the hip as well as a labral tear. This right here is what's called a cleft sign suggestive of a sports hernia. So this kid has a sports hernia as well as a, a hip impingement. And so we had him see our general surgeon. He was also found to have an inguinal hernia in conjunction with all this. So his soft tissues were, uh, were a mess. So he went ahead and had the laparoscopic uh, repair here. And then at the same setting, we went ahead and did a hip arthroscopy where we repaired this labrum. So again, very similar to our last professional athlete. You can see that there's tearing of the labrum where we're pushing on this labrum and uh, bouncing is a, what we call the wave sign. So that's suggestive of a labral tear. This kid's got a big pincer lesion that's present right next to his labrum. So we come in with a burr, we're shaving it all down, creating more space and decompressing that impingement. So that big bump is no longer there. Again, we're fixing the labrum, we're doing some fancy knot tying, passing the suture around the labrum, and then uh, putting it back down and reestablishing the suction seal. Again, the, we're looking at our uh, lateral retinacular vessels, making sure that we're pr uh, preserving our blood flow to the femoral head, because uh, that is at risk as well too. This is looking at the cam lesion, and then we come in with our device. We're utilizing x-ray throughout this whole time so that we're able to make sure that we have a smooth, even resection. And then this is looking at the afterwards. So we had this big bump of bone here, and we've gone all the way down the femoral neck, and you can see that we've now restored congruity, and we've, const uh, we've now made this back into a round peg here. And this is what the post-operative x-rays look like. So I'm just going to leave you on this one last thing. So hip impingement and athletic injuries are hand in hand because what's really at the epicenter of it is femoral acetabular impingement, this hip impingement. And this is a great video right here. So when you have this bump coming off of your femur, you're creating stress at your pubic symphysis where your, where your core muscles are attaching right here, but also at your SI joint as well. So the stress is being placed onto both areas. And this is a study that was done looking at individuals who had both intraarticular as well as extraarticular hip pain. When you just take care of the athletic pubalgia or the sports hernia, only 25% are able to return to play. When you take care of the FAI, 50%. When you take care of both, just like our last patient, both uh, this athlete supposed to uh, these athletes are able to return at 90%. And then looking at the professional athlete crowd, uh, there is a resolution of symptoms when just addressing the FAI. So just some final thoughts, there's lots of overlap. These athletic hip injuries are incredibly complicated and require a multidisciplinary approach. And at Columbia, we're fortunate that we have a whole team to help us manage these hip preservation uh, patients. The patients will tell you what's going on as well too. They'll lead you down the path of righteousness. I will tell you um, that based off, the, uh, based off their story and based off their x-rays, I will know what's going on 80% of the time. In terms of the rehab, it's incredibly important to make sure that we have good balance between uh, the hip adductors and hip adductors as well as the core muscles. Just because x-ray findings are present doesn't necessarily mean that it leads to symptoms. And just because a patient has a labral tear doesn't mean that they necessarily need surgery. The pain can be coming from one of many different locations. And surprisingly enough, patients can actually get better with surgery. So without further ado, uh, it's time for lunch, everyone. Thank you very much for your attention.